This is a movie in which we see certain kinds of performances that I don't think we've ever really seen before in a movie. So, now I'm being completely serious, although it's an incredibly entertaining movie, but it's, it's also, it feels like something new. So I want to start off by talking to you guys a little bit about that. I mean, Sean's been working with actors in really unconventional ways over the years from takeout, working with, uh, you know, uh, non-American, uh, Asian immigrants to uh, Starlet, which was about a porn star. Um, but uh, for you guys, how did you discover this movie and start to get an idea of what it actually was going to be? Maya, you want to start us off? Oh, okay. Well, you know, it starts out with me um, meeting Sean at the LGBT Center on McCadden in Santa Monica. He was walking into the courtyard. He was looking for um, people to talk to about the area, to learn more information about the area, and everybody was kind of blowing him off and being shady. You know, it's nothing new. And then, um, <laughs> he, he came over to me, and he told me, you know, well, I'm looking for information about this area because I want to make a movie. And so I was very nice and everything. I thought he was pretty hot, so. <laughs> And I guess he kind of fell in love with my story about all the things that I told him, about all the things I experienced, or the things that I knew from other people, or you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And then he also fell in love with my personality and how I was telling him the story. <laughs> Nikki, what about you? You go through a very different kind of experience over the course of this movie. I do, and it's funny because if, as actors, you know, if you answer an ad in backstage or Craigslist, and the guy writes back and is like, well, I'm shooting this on an iPhone and you're gonna get beat up in the street. <laughs> and you know, he writes back from some shady hotmail address. You're like, yeah, no, I think I'm good. I don't think I need this part. But luckily I had worked with the whole team before, um, Sean Baker, Chris Bergash, the producers. I'd worked with them on Starlet and also way back when I was an extra actually in Prince of Broadway. So I knew I was in good hands. I mean, I was still a little, I had a lot of trepidation about the physicality of it, but I really trusted that I was in good hands all the time. Sarah, right, what about you? You've been in a bunch of Sean's movies as well. What was it like getting involved? Did it feel familiar to you by contrast? Yeah, yeah. usually uh, with Sean, it's like the first film we did, he all of a sudden showed up at my work, uh, and he said, okay, let's go make a movie, I'm ready. And we literally <laughs> walked out, and we made, went and made Prince of Broadway. Uh, so this time around, he just called, said, there is the script uh, we have, uh, this is what this is about, how do you think you will fit in? And I said, well, I guess if it's an LA story, how about an Armenian cab driver? <laughs> so then uh, I became the Armenian cab driver. <laughs> and of course, uh, you know, my character there uh, is not just a cab driver. He also discovered some, you know, I guess, bisexual or homosexual urges, which, uh, I mean, he's, he's kind of lost, so it took him a while to convince me to do that uh, car wash scene. <laughs> I was resisting, but he convinced me, so that was it, yeah. And James, you've done a bunch of movies. How did this compare? Well, I did, I was in Starlet too. Um, and what happened was, was um, I was working on a play in New York, and Sean called me and he asked for a friend of mine's number, who's an actor. He was like, yeah, the character's pretty similar to the one you started, so I don't really want you to do this movie. And so I gave him my friend's number, and my friend never texted him back. He's like, hey, your bro didn't text me back, so are you free like two days in January? And so that's how I ended up working on the movie. So, because I guess like I just play shitbags in Sean Baker's movie. Now. Yeah, I have to say though, it was written for, the role was written for you. Am I supposed to be flattered by that? You're speaking about writing these roles. I mean, it, you really feel like you get to know these characters in a personal way, and, and it's hard not to imagine they're infusing it with some aspects of who they are. But to what extent did, did you write these characters and sort of discover the world that they live in? Well, um, yeah, as you just said, there are there are parts of their characteristics, their personalities that made it into the uh, into the characters. But um, from the very beginning, I wanted my performers to be playing characters. I mean, that was, that was, this is a fiction narrative film. So um, we, we actually, 
early on we did, uh, it, not everybody was involved in this. It was actually um, mostly Maya and Kiki, but we did workshop we workshopping sessions where we uh, almost in that style of Mike Lee um, where we had Chris and I uh, had already at that point uh, figured out where we were going with the script and we had scenes that were loosely scripted um, with some dialogue with an A, a to B arc but we um, we allowed we had time during uh, during our pre-production to actually spend time in these little low rent uh, rehearsal spaces on Santa Monica. And we would, uh, say, for example, we would set up the scene with the bus. And we're like, we, we, we just, uh, we had our characters sitting in chairs and saying, you're on a bus and uh, this is after Alexandra's performance and let's go. And we would just, and we, we would, um, Chris and I would have already some dialogue written, but we we encouraged improvisation, and I was, you know, just incredibly lucky that everybody here, everyone, just w they're all geniuses at improv. They they really, they um, not only just improv but comedic improv, which is I think the hardest thing to do. Well, Maya, that first scene between you and Kiki really sets the tone for the movie, and it's clear that, I mean, you really seem like you know each other. So tell us a little bit about developing chemistry with this, this other actor, because it just feels so natural in the movie. Well, it was definitely natural, because we knew each other. We lived together. You know, we would fight holes together. You know, like, <laughs> we did everything <laughs> together. So, like, um, the way we are on screen is how we are in actual real life. Like... I'll be like, okay, bitch, what's your tea? Come over here, girl. Girl, let's go check, let's go hang out. You know, let's go get something to eat. Like, that's just us in real life. So you see us on screen. That's how we are in real well, life. I, I was kinky, Kiki is a, is is a gentle sh soul. I don't think you know. Sean <laughs> doesn't know the real Kiki. Okay, he he does not know. No, she's nice in front of him because he's hot. <laughs> he's well, not that it's, hot. It's, <laughs> It's interesting though because it's uh, it makes you wonder, you know, how much of this movie did you kind of write or you know sort of play a role in shaping, especially since everybody here just watched it so it's fresh in their memories. I mean, are there scenes that really stand out to you as, yeah, like that's that's my trademark, that's that's my moment, you know, that you made that moment happen, really? Well, you know, there were definitely a lot of beats to hit. There was, um, I guess you could say the the whole thing was pretty much scripted. I guess you could say, but we were also able to put our own into every beat of the script. So I guess we kind of own the whole thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> the great thing too is when you're working with Chris and Sean, they have this amazing ability that you'll be in the heat of a moment of a scene and they'll just like throw out a line. They'll just feed you a line that wasn't originally scripted. So you're, it's almost like working, with, I mean, liter it is literal live screenwriters that are right there with you and it makes it so fresh and so intense because you just, I mean, I think a couple of the things in Donut Time, some of the really nasty stuff I say to Chester was literally like right behind me. They're like, say, da, da, da. And so it makes it even more just alive in that moment rather than memorizing it from three weeks ago on the page. Yeah, I want to ask you guys about, about Donut Time. I mean, there's so much that happens there in the last act <laughs> of the movie. And it, it's, it's interesting because it, it's very chaotic, but you still get a sense of, of what's going on. And you're all in that. So tell us a little bit about what, what it's like to do a scene like that. I mean, we just heard a little bit about the process, but just in terms of, you know, how many takes are you doing? Is it exhausting? Are you really at each other's throats? Or? Well, I've, we've talked about this a lot, but while we did have permits for... Well, most of the major locations, because we were so low budget, the donut time was actually still open for business. <laughs> so if you're an actor, you can kind of imagine what it's like when you're in the middle of something that you think might be your best take, and then somebody comes in and asks for a bear claw, um, can, might throw you. And the interesting thing is that Shi Ching, who is one of our producers who, who played Mama-san, she was also our uh, costume designer and keeping continuity. That, this is true. <laughs> no, th that's not funny. This is true. She also, at that moment in time, had to sell donuts to patrons in the middle of our scene. So it was a fucking nightmare, is really what I'm trying to express to everyone. I mean, it was a lot of fun, because everybody's really fast and has really, you know, on top of it, but... 
you know, just some dude meanders into your shot at like 2.30 in the morning on a Wednesday while you're just like trying to go home. It was Some, like sometimes we'd work those people in. I mean, it, sometimes if it got too crowded, we would pause, we would retreat out of, we would, you know, clear for a moment. But sometimes we actually tried to work in the real customers and get releases after the fact. We, we learned that from making takeout, basically. We, we shot a film called Takeout up here on the Upper West Side in a Chinese takeout on 102nd, uh, 102nd Street, and we didn't shut down their business for one minute. And it was where, that's where we sort of got the confidence that we could do it this time around as well. Karin, your character does something, I think, much uh, softer in certain ways. With the, these scenes with your family almost could be a different movie, like a domestic drama or something. And uh, I wonder, you know, what that kind of an acting challenge was like for you. I mean, you've worked with Sean a lot, but this is a very particular kind of character you're playing. It's not very, it's not that similar, I think, to, to the ones you've done before. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I try to portray a character who's, uh, who's a family man, obviously. Um, but he has, he discovered these uh, urges in himself and he doesn't know how to deal with it. He doesn't know what to do with it, right? So the only way he feels kind of home is with these uh, transgender prostitutes. And he, he, he's still tr trying to discover and understand what's going on with him. And uh, in, in, in our culture, you probably, if this was happening in Armenia with, with someone like this, if you get discovered, if not get killed, but you probably get badly hurt for it. Uh, and the guy who snitches him out, as you said, uh, he would be a hero. So um, I, I know someone who are tr I try to kind of have in mind to base my character. I'm not going to say who that is. Of course, he probably will see this someday. But um, 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 yeah, and also I want to take an opp this opportunity to give a shout out to other our Armenian cast, which are these incredible actors, uh, the actress who plays my mother-in-law. Ala Tumanyan, she's, uh, she's, she's like Armenian Sophie Loren, yeah. Uh, the actress who plays my wife, Luisa Nersesian, she was the, uh, she won the Armenian Academy Award last, last year. Uh, the guy who plays the, the cab driver there, he's, he's like the host of the uh, voice show in Armenia. These are big, big celebrities and they happen to be in LA. We reached out to them and they were happy to, uh, to show us their love. Yeah, and they helped in so many other ways as well. Uh, Karin and Arsen, actually, we had to script all the Armenian stuff tightly because Chris and I don't know Armenian. So uh, that all of, all of the Armenian dialogue in the film is scripted and, and, and acted out to the word. And um, they were very helpful in terms of uh, giving us guidance on you know, the, the tone of it how it would sound, the right words to be used, and then of course in post-production, which are the which were the best takes, which were the proper takes, et cetera. So they were very There's happy. a lot of humor there too, which unfortunately uh, American audience cannot understand, but hopefully someday Armenians will see it. And in Armenian dialogue, there's, there's a lot of humor, which you can't translate and be funny, obviously. So you're not gonna explain it all to us now. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's one thing to have that kind of entry point for understanding these characters. James, in your case, I, I don't suppose you could surround yourself with people who can sort of explain the, the humor of, of characters such as the, the ones that you're playing, but how did you come to understand sort of who this guy is and, and the world that he lived in? Um, I don't know. I, you know, uh, the thing about working on Sean's movies is, I've said this, they're really um, collaborative across the board. So, you know, before we started shooting, Sean would call me and say, hey, you have to run across town right now and meet this dude because this is kind of like half of what Chester is and then you got to meet this other guy. So I'd meet him and sort of go like, oh, okay, well, and then just amp up their douchebagginess like 10%, you know, and then and then I'm really, um, I think that, I think this makes me a bad actor actually, that I always try to look for the funny in everything, like even in the darkest, I, there's something I, I just can't help myself. That's always what I'll try to go for. So anywhere there's like a joke or I have a chance to make myself look stupid, um, I'll, I, you know, it's just like what I what I like to do. And I knew that we were sort of having worked with Sean before. I knew that uh, there was an there was a farcical element to it that I thought was really um, 
you know, it's really it's part it's part of what makes the movie so special is that it is like you know it's a it's a narrative it's a, a, a like a a story about friendship in L. A. You know, and I so I was just like, how do I add into this? Am I like the comic foil, like the clown? You know. Yeah, and, and part of the gamble of the whole thing is just the way in which it's made. And one of the questions that was asked on, on these cards in advance by an audience member has to do with iPhones. And specifically, they were asking how much money you saved. But I think a, a maybe just pivoting off of that in a bigger, a bigger question would be, how does this thing free up the kind of movie that you were making? Because it, it feels like this is the movie that it should be. I mean, you don't, we wouldn't want to see that on 35 millimeter film. Yeah, I would. <laughs> 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 you can't. No, but I can't. Um, but I, uh, yeah, there were there are many benefits that actually showed them, revealed themselves to us as we were shooting, and then of course in hindsight, of course I'm very happy we went down this road. But I wish I could say this was all planned, and I knew the iPhone would bring certain things. But you know, it was more of a budgetary thing. And then when we so how much money did it save? You? Well, oh, it's hard to say. It's uh, thousands and thousands, um, depending on what the what camera we would have used, what format we would have shot on. But I have to say, uh, and the most important thing, and this is you know, uh, uh, applying it to, to the way that we work together and from an acting aspect, uh, point of view, um, I found that the iPhone, I like to work with first time actors and mix them with seasoned actors with basically all of my films. And there's usually a, about a one week hump that the first time actors have to get over to get comfortable with having a camera in their face. Um, you know, Prince Adu from Prince of Broadway, Bissett Kid Johnson from Starlet, I saw their performance greatly improve after the first week. In this case, because the iPhone is a device that we all have in our pockets and we all, th it's the, that, that um, I think any intimidation factor was wiped away from minute one. So I saw the confidence level uh, for, from me, uh, Maya and, and Kiki on the same level as, as James from the first day. And it was really incredible to see that. And uh, I think the iPhone had a lot to do with it. Well, this leads to another interesting question we have here, which I think was aimed at you, but I want to give it to Maya instead, which is how do you know that you've hit upon an idea you should pursue? Because when this movie premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, you didn't have an acting career going on. That This movie started that, and now you've signed up to do another project. I, I'm curious to know more about sort of the offers that you've received and, and how you're thinking through this stage of, of your career now that you've, you know, what does it take to, to take that first step and say you want to pursue it? And then what's it like to sift through the kind of options that are being you know, put in front of you? Well, no pressure. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to figure out how to answer this. Um, okay, let's put it like this. In the beginning, like, okay, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, I've always wanted to be an entertainer. I sing naturally. Like, I've had many, many vocal lessons, but she really doesn't need none of that, but... Um, yeah, I've had vocal lessons for years, and um, I have a really high five octave range. But um, before my transition in my former life, I modeled for a few different companies like um, Page Parks in Houston, Texas, and um, First Models Houston. Then when I transitioned and everything, I, was, I decided, okay, I already, already went this far to be a woman and everything. I think I've achieved that. But... Um, <laughs> Um, then I got into the, the acting role was offered to me and I decided, okay, I'm gonna take this role and you know, just do my best with it. Like I felt like it was an opportunity that I just didn't want to turn down. Like why, why turn it down? But like I say on all of my interviews, never in a million years did I think that it would be this big. Like I was not expecting any of this at all. I'm very proud of it. But I just, um, the week before last, I just finished filming my second movie, which is Happy Birthday, Marsha. It's actually a short, and I'm really proud of it. It follows the life of Marsha P. Johnson, who's a trans activist. She was born in 1944. She was killed in 1992. So it was um, pretty awesome, I guess I could say. Um, but what was the rest of the question? <laughs> Well, I mean, talk, talk about some, you know, 
where do you go from here? I mean, are you are you going to keep taking on more projects along these lines, or are there other kinds of projects that you want to do? What what's the climate like for somebody in your situation right now? Most definitely. Um, I was also just offered another role for something else, but I can't give you too many details on that. And I'm also working on my first album, so yeah. <laughs> So I, I want to leave some time for some questions from the audience now that you've seen the movie, maybe you have some of the things you want to know specifically about it. But Sean, I mean, this approach keeps paying off for you in all these different ways. You have such a diverse filmography, and you also created Greg the Bunny in this like uh, bizarre other career you have going on. But talk about sort of the trajectory in, uh, of, of, your, of, your, of your career so far. I mean, why, is it, why does this approach work so well for you? And, and when, you know, how does it inform what you want to keep doing it's it's hard to say and i hate being too self-analytical because i fear that it will somehow negatively influence what i do down the line and then it will be too contrived and it won't come from an organic place anymore uh but all i have to say is that um <clears throat> there are certain with all these films i think what chris and i have been trying to do um and, and the rest of this team that I just love and I have surrounded myself with, I, I, wh I, we're, we're taking universal themes, hopefully, you know, themes of like, for example, friendship from this film and trying just to apply them to uh, communities, to um, cultures that, um, that we rarely get to see on, on, on film and or on TV. I, I just, uh, because I have a really simply a personal interest um, I, I, uh, I'm kind of uh, done with watching whitewashed, you know, suburban USA uh, stories. <laughs> I, I came from there, and I'm just not really that interested. So, um, uh, but no, but it really, it, it really depends. I have no idea what, what film is coming next, quite honestly, and it's really just about, you know, exploring the world and, 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 uh, and meeting new people, and uh, and so I, I I really don't know where where it's headed, but um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Can't no, that's a that's a pretty good way of answering. I mean, for those who haven't seen Sean's other movies, they're worth seeking out. And there are some people who may have made up a, a takeout and then decided they want to make a bigger movie. And it seems like you're you're staying on the right scale that works for you, not over. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> scale. <laughs> okay. No, I. Well, to tell you the truth, I mean, subject wa subject matter wise, yeah, I I. I'm I'm happy with the filmography so far, and I'm happy with the subjects that we've explored. And um, but scale is a totally different thing. I'm actually really kind of sick of the micro budget filmmaking, and I'm done with it. And and I thought I was done with the two films back. The budget shrank by half. Yeah. After yeah. Starlet. It's also so it state. actually we actually went the other way. Yeah. It's the so state of the industry right now. I mean, I would I would love to see. Um, you know, just, just I, I would love the freedom, and I don't know if I could ever get that, but to to make uh, bigger budgeted films in which people actually get paid correctly, p p paid, you know, the, and so I'm going off the rails. I'm no, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's important to have, uh, you know, filmmaking, acting, everything to do with this medium, you know, it should be, it should be a career. And lately, it seems like it's turned more into a hobby. You know, we're, we're not getting paid the right amount of money to do our art. And, um, and the industry has been changing so much that, uh, that it's difficult to keep up with where, where ha the proper direction to go and where we can find uh, financing, et cetera. Yeah, the middle class actors are definitely being pushed out as long, like, you know, almost with every other industry and it's a really upsetting thing because I've been doing this for 15 years and I did four movies last year and it was the least I've made in five years so it's been a really it's really bizarre to watch this go th to watch filmmaking go the rest of the way that the country is going which is like really 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 wealthy Jurassic World or nothing do you know what I mean and uh, yeah it's 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 I hope I don't know I don't know how we get back towards the middle of things um, you know, it's distressing, and it's kind of a bummer when I think about it often. That's because it, it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon. Maybe we have some more chipper directions we could take <laughs> with the <laughs> audience <laughs> questions. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. 
Okay, we're going to take questions. Make sure they're in the form of a question. Right. Well, just to say, I, 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 uh, I really appreciate the, the music, the music, and the use of Toyland and why we use Toyland. And uh, yeah, I definitely appreciate you bringing that up because it was actually Dar producer Darren Dean uh, that pitched it to me, knowing that I we were looking number one for a public domain because of our budget, a public domain Christmas song that Maya could perform. Um, but not only that, using Harry Horlick's and his orchestra's version of that really brought us back to those, uh, th those, those early comedies, the, the follies of the 30s, uh, pr in particular, of course, Babes in Toyland, March of the Wooden Soldiers, which I absolutely adore, and I think it's one of the best comedies ever made, one that hasn't aged, and it's 1931 or 30, I'm sorry, 34, I believe. And so thank you for pointing that out. And it was hard to convince Maya, though, to perform that because, well, why don't you explain? <laughs> that song was boo. <laughs> like, I was like, uh-uh, this shit is too old and my voice is too good to be singing this. <laughs> like, I really originally wanted to do Tony Braxton's Santa Please because it's so sexy and seductive and it just, it just totally embodies Maya Taylor. <laughs> so, yeah. I hated it. But I, but I love my, my version. <laughs> Which will be on the soundtrack. We have a soundtrack actually coming out July and 10th. It's totally different from how I normally sing. I don't sing that soft and everything. I have a really, really strong voice. So I had to do some training for that. Any other questions maybe for the actors? Uh, I have a question for the director. I have two questions, so I'll make it really fast. Um, first of all, thank you for the experience. It was great. Just the essence of LA came out visually just so beautifully, I think. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the soundtrack, about the inspiration for the music. Yeah. And the second question is the throw up in the taxi cab. <laughs> How did you make it so real? Well, <laughs> it was real. real. It is real. The music <laughs> is just, uh, let's just say I, I, I was, uh, it was, I discovered trap music, which was the first trap track in the movie, and then that really dictated the rest of the style. And then we just started going eclectic as the film got crazier, we just started mixing it up. So that's that. Um, and then with the vomit, um, <laughs> Josh Sussman, who is actually one of the biggest names in the film, he's actually on Glee, um, he came to me and said, you've had a vomit scene in every one of your films up to now, and I would like to be the guy who does it in this film. <laughs> and I said, well, no, it's too late. We can't do it anymore because they don't sell Epicac over the counter, which is a vomit-inducing fluid that you take when you're poisoned. Uh, so he said, it doesn't matter. Trust me. I'll vomit on cue. <laughs> and he showed, showed up, up wasted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is not exactly the safest way of doing this. But anyway, so he, uh, but he did. Serious he method acting. Yeah, serious <laughs> method acting. And he was, the guy he was uh, vomiting on in the cab was our co-screenwriter, Chris Bragash, who's back there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. It's, this gets brought up at every one of our Q&As. There's a lot of vomit talk. It's really wild. That vomiting scene was actually much longer than what you see here. Mm. It was one take, but it was probably about you know seven, eight minutes. And uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, at some point, I I, I want to hear it cut. I can't hear it cut, and I'm kind of concentrated. <laughs> so I pull my head up. I see the whole crew is vomiting, including the director, the sound guy, the everybody. Of course, I and mean, we're, uh, yeah, we're the smelling uh, it. All, all yeah. five sh uh, Sean movie, uh, sh Sean's movies have vomit scenes, but the amount of vomit on this one <laughs> was just incredible. It was just kept on coming and coming. We're done shooting the scene. The guy just keeps going, keeps going. <laughs> and I remember how Chris was giving him instructions. Don't worry if it gets in my face. If Don't worry about it. Just at, at some point, I see like he's looking for Chris's face just to, and just keeps going. <laughs> This is going to make a great DVD extra. Yeah. <laughs> right, we got time for a few more. How many days did it take to shoot, and also how did you record the sound? Oh, um, our sound recordist is um, Iron Strauss. He's a wonderful sound recordist who, who really is a trooper and understands sometimes my guerrilla filmmaking method, so is he rolls with it. And all of the cab scenes, he's in the trunk. Uh, he's six foot five, and he's in the trunk. Um, he, uh, he, we, we, we went ahead and had a professional setup with a, a separate sound recording that we, we, we uh, sunk in post. So, you know, we didn't skimp on sound. 
And actually, to tell you the truth, it would be the gi biggest giveaway. If you saw us from across the street, you wouldn't know we're shooting a feature except for the fact that sometimes there was a boom pole or his cart. Uh, so anyway, uh, he's, he's wonderful, and I really have to give him props for this because it's, 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 he was a one-man show. And so, um, and then what was the other? Oh, how many days? days? Uh, 23 days. I, I really don't like those sort of 14-day uh, guerrilla, let's kill all cast and crew and kill ourselves sort of uh, schedules. I don't think it's right for anybody, and it's not fair. So I always tell my producers I need at least 23 days. Uh, also, it has a lot to do with the acting as well, and the, the time it takes for people to fall into character and to get to, one, to, get to know each other. And it's just, it, uh, it, it, for me, those, those shortened, you know, abbreviated uh, schedules just don't, you can see it. You can see it that the characters aren't as developed. So we have time for a few more. Hi. Um, I was curious just about the title of the movie. Um, I was watching the movie wondering if there was like going to be some reference or explanation about tangerine but i um maybe i just didn't get it there's a, a little reference in the in the air freshener but there's not it's more to do with just the um for me it's just a non it's an it's not a literal title it's something to do with the sense the feeling that you get from the color and the and the fruit and for me when we in post production when we really elevated the, the colors. Um, that orange hue became the dominant color and uh, it just felt right. You know, I felt like every other art form, the artist is allowed to title their piece of art, whatever they want. You know, if you're a musician, your song can be, you know, poetic and it's in the way you title it or the painting or a novel. But for film, it seems like we always have to stay to literal titles and uh, I just wanted to get away with, get away from that, yeah. Um, hello. <laughs> How did you set on the budget? Like, what were you thinking about when you actually set a number of like, this is how much money I want to spend, and this is what I want to spend the most of it on? Like, maybe we can spare a little bit more on that. Like, I already heard it's the iPhone, and you actually spent a lot of money in the sound, and that was great. And but how how did you come down to a budget? It, it actually started off well. Mark and Jay Duplass, executive, produced the film, and it was basically a dictated budget at first, and we we budgeted the film out based on the script and it was a lot higher than he he had first wanted to spend and so we were basically locked at a certain place we begged to get up to a certain number and we had to to stick to that um but we were uh we were breaking the model of what i think a lot of micro budget do i mean when uh, we're, we're very low budget. We're not allowed to say the exact number, but let's just say Starlet was made, my previous film was made for 235000 and this was less than half of that. Okay, I can say that much. And so um, basically, you know, w the model that you usually follow when you make a micro-budget film like this is shoot in one location, have like, three or four actors at most, and it's very dialogue heavy and not much action or, or company moves. Well, I tried to go up and down Santa Monica and have an ensemble cast. So we decided let's throw as much of that, on, uh, throw as much money up on the screen. And that was also part of the reason that we settled eventually on the iPhone, knowing that we would save the money there. There was one, one more question. Here. Up here. This guy's had his hand up for a long time. Right here. With the with the A plot or the B plot of the family, you mean? Or let's repeat the question. It's, it's what was the the intention with the plot of the movie? What did you want the audience to sort of understand about the relationship between these characters? Well, first and foremost, on just very very generally, I I wanted I wanted to play with perception. You know, I wanted to I want I I I would like the audience to be able to identify with these characters by but hopefully uh, through what I consider a very universal theme, which is, is friendship. And then this other theme of infidelity. You know, we've all been in situations, I, or may, many of us have perhaps been in situations in where there's jealousy involved, we find out about a cheating spouse. So we had these two themes, you know, friendship and then two parallel stories of, of infidelity converging on this corner. Um, so it was really, you know, it was about telling this, this story and, and hopefully, you know, having an audience um, who's not part of this world 
yet still identify with these characters and be able to have empathy for these characters, like I did, like I, like what happened to me when I was in my research process and I got to know the women on the streets and I got to know them on a one one on one basis, and and uh, and perhaps that's what I was looking for. You know, it's hard for a filmmaker to 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 answer that question because. Uh, it's very complex, and there are many answers to that question. Well, maybe we should give it to the actors. Yeah, I mean, please. What do you guys think this movie is about? Um, I said this earlier today that the specific is in the universal. That the more that you can focus on something that it's like Adam at its core, the more people will universally feel it, right? So, if you're really curious about something, like you know, you can see the entire uh, universe in an Adam. It's the same thing with film, you know? And so it's like, I'm gonna look at this very specific location that's happening at a very specific moment in time in a very specific place. And out of that, everybody goes, oh, I completely relate to these people, you know? And I think that the sort of the n nature of the subject matter is transcended by that, you know? And I think that that's what's so special about working on uh, Sean's movies because that's the running thread, you know? B are we what what areas of culture have we sort of stepped over and not looked at and didn't pay attention to? And they're all over the place. They're all in front of us. So if anybody walks away going, I didn't think about this area and this place in time, and I do now, and I see a bunch of human beings that otherwise went unnoticed to me, then, I mean, isn't that what filmmaking is supposed to do, you know? Like, uh, these, these really universal feelings that we all have, these mythologies to to make us sort of relate to each other as, as just human beings on like an eye to eye level, no greater, no worse. I mean, that's a, what it's supposed to be. Unfortunately, it's, it's not always that, but I guess we're really lucky that Tangerine, you know, is the little engine that could float it to the top. It's a really terrific note to end on, I think, except to say that the movie is opening in what, two weeks, something like that? July 10th. July 10th, and yep. it's worth telling people about that. Yeah, if you like the film, please spread the word, um, Twitter, Facebook, all that. But it's in here in Manhattan, it'll be down at the Sunshine and over at Lincoln Center. And um, the, f the other films that we've mentioned, we're actually having a slightly, like, s a mini retrospective, I guess you could say. Uh, Prince of Broadway, Starlet, and Tangerine are all playing on the same night um, at Lincoln Center on the 9th the 9th of July. Don't miss him. Thanks for sticking around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.